15.3. This is on the fundamental theorem. Of line intervals. So this is a fairly quick section actually um, for an intro. Let me just remind you of the fundamental theorem of calculus, which you may not recall, but you use it all the time without thinking about it. So the fundamental theorem, let's say the fun theorem, because it's fun, of calculus. States, let me give it by way of an example. So it states that when you're taking the integral, the definite integral, something like this, from 0 to 1 of x dx, that you can do this by finding an antiderivative, uh, plugging in the endpoints. Right? So this is what you do when you do integrals. Right? But what's in reality happening is over on the left, this is sort of representing an area. It's the fundamental theorem. Oops, let me write T in that. It's the fundamental theorem of calculus that says that you can use an antiderivative to do it. So you find the antiderivative and then you plug in the quote unquote endpoints, the zero and the one. So this is really useful because it means you don't need to do areas by you know, Riemann sums and awful calculations like that. So the fundamental theorem of line integrals is a similar theorem for basically for integrals, for line integrals of vector fields. Now, one thing to notice about the fundamental theorem of calculus is you have to be able to find an antiderivative, right? Like in this case, the x here, let me sort of refer back to it this x has to have an antiderivative, right? Because then you can put it in. If it didn't have an antiderivative, you know, hope would be lost. You wouldn't be able to do it. So, fundamental theorem of line integral says the following. It's a very long name. Uh, I'm just going to call that the Tolley fundamental theorem of line integrals from here on out, so we don't need to write it. It says the following. So the analogy is when I want to do a line integral of a vector field, if that vector field is conservative, then we can use this theorem. And we'll sort of explain about the relevance of that in, in a physical sense as we go. But it says the following. It says, it says suppose that F is a conservative vector field. with potential function little f. So remember this means that is just to remember that the vector field is the gradient of the potential function. And suppose c is a curve Now, a comment about this curve, and let me actually just say this before I go further. This is a curve with a direction, has to be oriented. So let's just say with direction. And what happens is that the integral over C of f dot dr, this is the line integral of the vector field that represents work, if you like, that this is little f of the endpoint minus little f of the start point. So if you stop, you can sort of see the analogy between this thing and the fundamental theorem of line integrals. In the fundamental theorem of line integrals, you took the x up here again. Let me recircle that right here. And we took its antiderivative to get to here. Here, I'm taking the f, and I'm sort of like taking its anti-gradient, if you like. It's not really a word, but... And then we're plugging in the endpoints, and we're getting the answer. So, of course, this will only work if, if such a little f exists. I mean, this will only work for a conservative f-bar. Uh, but pretty much, so 
if you remember at 15.2 B, I made a comment that when we do line integrals of vector fields, there'll be four different ways to do it. And we did one, which is like the really nitty gritty way of parameterizing the curve and going that way. And then what I said is the other ways will be pretty, it'll be pretty obvious when you would use them. So the deal here is if F is conservative, this is the thing you would use, right? Because it makes it so much easier. You don't have to parameterize anything. So the deal here is, is if F is conservative, use this. It's sort of no questions asked because, you know, you find a little F, you plug in your endpoints, you've got your answer. So let's take a look at a really, really simple example. So suppose, say, F of x, y is something like 1 plus 2 x, y, i, and say x squared j. And let's suppose that our c is parameterized Like R of T, this could be particularly messy as we'll see T squared plus T plus 1 I plus, say, um, T cubed plus 2 T minus 1 J with T between 1 and 2. And then let's say find the integral over C of big F dot dr. So for solution, this is what we see. We see that F is conservative. Now, you may not see that immediately, so it may take a second to think back, like, how do we prove something's conservative? Well, we can take the curl and see that it's zero, and that the function is that the vector field is defined everywhere. That's sort of the long way. Um, in this one, in this particular case, the original vector field is actually sort of simple enough. This guy right here is simple enough that you can eyeball the potential function. So remember, I'm looking for a function whose gradient is this big F. So this has potential function, little f of x, y equals, um, in this case, x plus x squared y. And if you're not clear, right, it's worth taking a second. Nothing wrong with taking a second to remind us that if I take this guy and I take f sub x, I will get this. And if I take this guy and I take f sub y, I will get this. And again, there are a bunch of different ways to find this. We had a procedure way back in 15.1. We have a method for checking if it's conservative. So I don't want to dwell on that too much. I just want to say, like, in this case, it's conservative. Here is the potential function right here. So then we find the start point and the end point. So the curve starts at r of 1. So this is 1 plus 1 plus 1 is 3i plus 1 plus 2 minus 1 is 2j. So that's 3, 2. And it ends at r of 2. Let's plug in 2, I get 4 plus 2 plus 1 is 7. I, we get um, 2 cubed is 8, plus 4 is 12, minus 1 is 11j, so it's 7, 11. Thus, by totally, by the fundamental theorem of line integrals, this integral that we want is little f of 7, 11, minus little f of 3, 2. We have little f, so this is, have a little f is x plus x squared y. This is 7 plus 7 squared 11 minus 3 plus 3 squared 2. That is it. That is the final answer. Done. Right there. So you can see why this is so much easier. I didn't have to... You know, the long way would have been find this, you know, we have the parameterization already, but plug the parameterization in, turn into an integral from, in this case, 1 to 2, do the integration, plug in the 2, plug in the 1. It gets pretty long. So this is much, much quicker than the alternative. So uh, let me do another quick example. 
another example. Let's say find integral over c. So I'm going to write the notation slightly different in this case. I'll use this dx dy dz notation. So it's the integral over c of y dx plus x dy minus 1 over z squared dz. Where c, say, starts at 1, 2, 3 and ends at, say, 3, 2, 1. So the reason I wanted to do this partly to make this note is to, to note that the integral, this is the line integral of a vector field because it's, remember this is the alternate notation for this. So it's important to notice that because when I look at this, you might not see, you know, in the original form up here at the top, you might not immediately see the vector, but here you see the vector. Right? So this is the f in this case. So again, we notice this f is conservative. With um, little f of x, y, z, this is a pretty easy one to see. This is x, y plus 1 over z. So the integral over c of that, I'll just write the f for now, dot dr, rather than rewriting the entire thing. This is little f of 3, 2, 1, because that's where it ends. I have a little f of 1, 2, 3, because that's where it starts. So this is x, y plus 1 over z. So 3 times 2 plus 1 over 1 minus 1 times 2 plus 1 over 3, and that is it. Done. Now, what I want to do next is I want to make a comment about this question, which is also related to, um, to why it's called a conservative vector field. And, but there are a bunch of other notes I want to make too, so let me put them all together in a big set of notes. Three notes. So note A is that you'll notice in this final example, the second of the two, that what I said is I said C starts at 1, 2, 3 and ends at 3, 2, 1, and it doesn't matter which way C goes, right? As long as it, in other words, let's just clarify, it doesn't matter which route that it takes between 1, 2, 3 and 3, 2, 1, as long as it goes from 1, 2, 3 to 3, 2, 1. We never needed to know what it was doing between those. Right, so notice that when f is conservative, the path that c takes from the start to the finish doesn't matter. So there's a phrase that comes in here that sometimes we say that the integral is independent of path. This is another phrase that you'll read sometimes. So showing that the integral is independent of path means exactly showing that f is conservative. They mean exactly the same thing. So B, the second thing we see, that if f is conservative, and c is closed, so remember what that means. Closed means the start equals the end. So what can we see, right? If the start is the end, then f of the start and f of the end are the same, and when you plug them into little f, whatever it is, you will get zero. Right? So, in other words, you would do this, you would get little f of the end minus little f of the start, and you would get zero because these two guys right here are equal. So this is interesting because it means when f is conservative and c is closed, you don't need to do anything. Right? You know it's zero, right? so it's automatically zero. 
but this only works under these two circumstances, right? So if not conservative or not closed, then nope, I can't just do this. And third thing, this is possibly fairly obvious at this point, but just because as we go through the chapter, I want to tie all these integrals together, that if f is not conservative, then we cannot use fundamental theorem of line integrals. So the way to think about that is, if it is conservative, use the fundamental theorem of line integrals, period. If it's not conservative, you cannot use the fundamental theorem of line integrals. So as you're breaking down your different approaches to these line integrals of vector fields, right now you have a binary choice. If it's conservative, you do this. If it's not conservative, you do the other manual way from before. And we're going to add to that as we go along. But as we progress, sort of add these things to your little list of, uh, of ways that you can tackle these problems. And then last thing, let me actually put this over here just so it all fits together. This is really the end of the section because it's so quick. Is the term conservative is used. This is actually most easily seen in part B here. So the term conservative comes from the fact that what's happening is that energy is being conserved. And so if you start and you end at the same point, the root doesn't matter. In other words, the work done sort of cancels itself out. So the word conservative this arises. You don't need to know this for doing these problems, but it's sort of interesting to know where the word comes from. Arises from the fact that energy is conserved. So our total work in a loop, in a, let's say in a closed loop, uh, is zero. Uh, path taken doesn't matter. Right, basically what's happening is the, uh, the work all balances out. So that's where the term conservative comes from originally. It comes from these sorts of applications of them. So in any case, that's the end of the section. Uh, end of 15.3.